Hello everyone, my name is River, and welcome to the Nimitan. A consistent topic that is brought to my attention is on the matters of non-dualism, and that there is a belief that due to the nature and design of the Tree of Life, which the vast majority of interested individuals know of, there is an inherent dualism, an idea of separation between two, which, albeit, is very logical, as a great deal of metaphoric anthropomorphism, or explanations, are used as a means of further elucidating the various aspects and interaction between the Sphoroth, the Four Worlds, and the Partsufim within the Tree of Life. But this is in fact an error of understanding. We must know and analyze a few things to fully grasp the ideas of oneness, which is in itself non-dualistic, if we are to bound ourselves upwards the rungs of esoteric wisdom, and finally we will do so from the Kabbalistic perspective and its existing explanations. We begin with the topic of the four worlds, then we will expand this into the supernal genesis, then a less common Sephirotic diagram, as in a different perception of the tree of life, and punctuate this teaching with the big picture, if you will. So. Dualism is the concept of a system or philosophy in which the core understanding is one of two faces, such that the common idea includes this and that, I and not I, impressioner and recipient, positive and negative, or most commonly today, the idea of masculine and feminine forces. A person who studies the Kabbalah will by and large be forced into this mentality if they lack a foundation because of the complexities and metaphysical structure. Like the Tree of Life itself, whose depiction is one that is normally analyzed from a left and right perspective. What I mean is that the two pillars are ascribed some separation and distinction from one another which naturally leans the mind of the learning person into the ideas of dualism. Yet, when studying the four worlds in Supernal Genesis, there is a great revelation to be had on the grand oneness of the divinity. Now, I suspect you know of the four worlds, but for clarity and newcomers, we're going to be speaking on Atsiluth, Bria, Yetzra, and Asiya, which we know as emanation, creation, formation, and action. We might see this depicted on the tree in a variety of ways. Some I favor, some I simply think look nice. But the differences need not concern us too greatly for the moment. When viewing the tree of life in such manner though, we note a few common interpretations. The idea of the top-down form. Basically, if you exist in Asiya, as we the living body do, you are not within the other three worlds such that each world is exclusive to itself. This idea isn't entirely an error, as it seems that we are only capable of experiencing a single world in any given moment, we being limited to the most immediate experience of the result, the lowest effect, if you will, of the greater divine action that is notable or noted as the cause. There are causes beyond causes in the metaphysical spaces of the Kabbalah, but we don't want to stretch ourselves too far beyond what is needed. So, each world being exclusive to the next is, as I said, a perception of their interrelation. Yet, in the Kabbalistic philosophy, they're actually included one within the other at all times. You may ask, how is it possible to think that at all moments the upper spaces are included within the lower spaces? And that's not a bad question, but there's an easy explanation against it. It is known that everything below subsists and it sustains itself through the higher. This metaphorical statement alludes to the idea that everything going on below requires the upper, at all times, at every inkling of a moment, to continue to be. We may also note this from Deeper Secrets, to quote the Greater Holy Assembly, were the eye closed even for one moment, no thing could subsist. Therefore, it is called the open eye, the eye which is the substance of all things. As you may now fully see, maybe pun intended, 
The idea of a consistent or ongoing generative act is one of profound significance, and anything below another directly requires the higher to sustain itself. We might think of all the passages of the Zohar in which the waters are gathered and distributed. They are passing along the firmament and drip below, by which the below, its inhabitants and needs, are satisfied and kept in perpetual motion. It is even well known that the concept of perpetual motion exists within the Ouroboros. It exists in the sign of the circle, and while it also promotes a cyclical experience of events, a cyclical continuation of all things, it too represents the idea of perpetual, because it is unending and never stops the pursuit of perfection. You may then wonder, does the capacity to sustain ever end? Will the lower that subsists or exists upon the higher ever cease in this reception? No. And this is another reason to why the upper space is called Ein Sof, without end, because all things of limitation depend upon that which has no limitation. Therefore, it is all made eternal. Now we may turn our attention to the title of this video, and there is no separation in them, which will be expounded upon further via diagrams. The tree of life, as I said, is viewed in a sense that each space is distinctly separate from the next, but in actuality this is illusory, such that each item of the lower is contained within the higher. Higher and lower in this case is a reference to grade, degree, and a plethora of other descriptors, by which we are actually describing something quite profound. Higher rightly means closeness, as in a closeness to the divine source. So, with attention to detail, we can may now gaze upon what is typically called a concentric circle diagram of the Tree of Life. You may wonder, which diagram is correct between these two? In truth, they are both correct, but explaining different concepts to the viewer. As stated, we by perception disconnect each world or space from each other. In this case, it is the Sphiroth, or the worlds, that are seemingly brought into smaller rungs, distinctly downward. The line at the midsection is called Kav, the Kav is the sign of the descent of essence from that holy ancient and concealed one. It may seem to be odd, or you may wonder, why is it a descent of essence? Why is it described as moving downward? And this is again a matter of grades and degree. While we won't be discussing Zimzum thoroughly, simply know this. It is said that all manner of essence within the infinite is perfectly distributed, without limitation of subsistence, therefore a cavity, a space we could say, was formed from a grand contraction, all for the sake of creating one thing, limitation, which exists within, as in inside of, the infinite and unlimited. Therefore, we must be critical and logically inclined. If the space within the infinite is perfectly distributed, and infinite, it matters not at some such place or any other manner of distinction this occurred. If the space of limitation is, and by this logic clearly was formed, as it says in the Zohar when the king desired to emanate, then it is known that this is a lower grade, that limitation does not best or confront infinitude and limitlessness. So now you know. This is why it says the light descends, because it is the only act that can occur. Now, before moving on, there is another idea behind why it says the light descends, and this explanation will be an analysis of the letters. We're pulling from Tikkunoi HaSohar, the Harab Mag translation, specifically folio 6b, wherein we find Adonai receives its light from above, from the uppermost of everything. He, the uppermost of everything, 
flows from above to below, and rests his high light upon Yod of Adonai, that spreads and then returns from a below to above, up to Ein Sof, which is hinted at in the word Ein, meaning nothing. It is hinted at because the letters of Ein, or nothing, are the same as the name Adonai, aside from the presence of Delet, which I interpret as the spreading of the light or distribution of it across the four worlds. Then we may note this. Ain is arranged as Yod before Nun, and Adonai is Nun before Yod. Thus the light descends from the center of Ain and returns back up from Adonai, much like a circuit. And this is akin to the descent of the Logos, its revealment, distribution, and then return. Well, that was intense. Anyways, the Kav or line of light descending has been explained. You know the worlds, now we must finally tackle the intermingled existence more basically, as I'm sure someone will be benefited by a more thorough investigation. So, limitation exists inside of the infinite, and is sustained by it. Just as this is true, so too do the upper worlds, like Atziluth, assist in the sustainment of that which is below it. Without Atziluth, there is no Bria. Without Bria, no Yetzera, and so on. The act of formation is the foundation to the physicality. The foundation is the root or source of that which the common man says is, as in, is the universe. With that, we can now more clearly see the whole of things. Atziluth not only sustains the lesser grades, it too is revealed ever so subtly in them. Otherwise, no conception of it would even be capable of existing. We know of the Holy and Ancient Concealed One because at the most subtle states, there are inklings of this immensely descended light, this essence. In terms of the concentric circle diagram, we see this quite readily. The space of Atziluth, while looking to be more of a hoop, a donut, if you will, is actually existent from the center of the circle to the outer reaches of its space. The revealment of the next world makes it appear to be distinctly separate, but the emanative process, being constant, perpetually permeates every single space below, and is perfectly distributed, which is why it is a circle. An image of the infinite nothingness, that we consider nothing, but is in truth the totality of the divine. Let me give a more direct example, based on our perception. We are in Asiya, and to be within Asiya is also to have connection with all things above, as in the spaces above Asiya have inklings, drops of their essence within each other, all for the sustainment of Asiya, which is the end of these matters. Now I know there are a lot of people out there looking for the practical applications of these topics. So let's go ahead and speak on why these are important from an active standpoint. The metaphysical understanding, the theory, as common Western occultism calls it, is immensely significant as an agent of operation, because it is within the mind of ourselves, the spirit too, that all manner of activities, such as considered magical in nature and quality, are derived. We will classify these into two forms the receptive and active agents. The human being is itself receptive to all which is above it. Therefore, it is in the spaces of revelation and mental insight that the true operative and active faculty begins to unfold, otherwise called Gate 18 from the 32 Gates of Wisdom. A vast majority might call these metaphysical senses, because they're pulled not from Asiya, rather from the other worlds of interaction, that while still within the limitation generated by Zimzum, are ever present in our own. Senses are, especially in this case, all a receptive act. It is an act of taking into oneself. Yet there is more to this, something that many individuals are much more covetous of in their lack of knowing, the active aspect and that an individual is in a giving position, 
the distribution and interaction with the higher spaces. Let us consider this. If the receptive agent of the individual approaches the upper spaces, the said person may have means of engaging with it. Thereby, it can attempt to cause distribution as it sees fit. But to be honest, the methodology is discreet. The reasons behind the Kabbalists and their prayer, their blessings, and such, is all for the sake of benefactor of the whole, and for the rectification. Even the Zohar goes so far as to say, he who forms connections and elevates up to this chamber draws good will from Hashem. Also it says, joyful is the portion of he who knows to connect with this unification. He is beloved above and below, because he, the man in question, acts as negation. So, negation is odd, and in terms of the Kabbalah's magical prowess, just know that the secret is hidden in Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 through 33. Now for understanding some of the rules, before someone runs off and does something they shouldn't, the Zohar also says, he who exploits the crowns of the Torah shall fade away. How does he fade away, you may wonder? I suspect by the millstone. Well everyone, thanks for joining me, and if you think I've lost my mind, maybe I have. A massive thanks to my supporters, friends, and patrons that help make all of this possible. I appreciate you more than you know.